Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another Prep Hour with Steve's session. It's September 28, 2022 right now. I'm broadcasting live out of Brisbane. Uh, I hope this finds you well wherever you're located and that your OET exam progress is progressing well. So I can see people in the chat box already. Hi, Aya and Tisha. Um, hello to the people in YouTube. Um, hello to Nigeria. Welcome, Ikra. Hello. Hello, Jenny in Thailand. And lots of people coming in. Hello to Saudi. Yep, type in your location, everyone. We're running this at a different time zone, so we're hoping to reach out to different locations. Um, perhaps you're somewhere in in that middle zone, UK, Europe, or Africa, perhaps you're in the USA, East or West Coast, or even Canada, you might be down under where I am in Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, wherever it is you're located. Hello to Spain, Pakistan, Turkey, Romania is here, excellent. And I'll just get up my Facebook chat as well. And I'll just get up my Facebook chat and I'll just mute that one there. So we're on multiple channels, everyone. Hello to England as well. All right. Hello to Sudan and Nigeria, Kurdistan, Belgium, Egypt. It's excellent. All right. We've got a bit to do, everyone, so let's get started. Um, you can see on this screen I have here, we're going to look at paraphrasing the case notes. So it's a writing focus. Um, we'll look at language, vocabulary. Just look at some techniques. Uh, they're very important for OET. You really need to be able to look at a set of case notes and you know that information is important, important, you select it, but how do we get it into a formal and professional uh, sentence summarizing the case? That's what we're, gonna, what we're gonna look at today. It's a skill that you can develop over time. The more you practice, the more exposure you get, the better you will become at this very important skill. So I hope you got your pen in hand, take some notes, um, but also it's going to be an interactive session. So do get active on the keyboard. If you're attending live, if you're watching the video right now, whatever point in time it may be, still have a go. See if you can fill in the gaps. Um, it's live for you. And yes, have your notebook handy and apply what you um, learn for your own writing skills. All right, let's get cracking, everyone. And a last shout out, hello to the Ukraine. Best wishes to you there. And hello, Zambia and Ireland. Lots of people everywhere. Wonderful to see. All right. Firstly, quick, quick little uh, spruik about OET Online. Look, we do OET Online. We are an all-stars provider. A few things about us very quickly. Um, we're an all-stars provider, which means we've been endorsed by the OET Center. And we have courses for all 12 professions. So it doesn't matter what your profession is. We have a course for you and we're fully endorsed by the OET Center. What does that mean? It means they've checked our content um, to make sure that it reflects what you would face on exam day. So rest assured, if you do study with us, you will get exam quality material regardless of your profession. Um, and that's our website, everyone, um, oetonline.net.au. And we do offer a free taster course. So you can just pop in at any time, get a feel for study, do a little bit of practice. Um, you can even do a, a placement sort of test so you know your level. And then if you're interested, select a course and study. So that's who we are, everyone. Um, there's the website. You can see it there. Head on over. All right, 
Now we're going to look at paraphrasing. As I said earlier, paraphrasing has a lot of meanings. Um, you might need to use synonyms. You might have to rephrase a section. You might have to summarize a section of the case notes. Uh, occasionally you're going to have to interpret. You might have a whole lot of numbers or figures. What, what do they mean? Um, all those lab test results, that sort of thing. So you might have to interpret it. Um, you're going to have to be careful with sentence structure, with clauses, um, independent and dependent clauses in your sentences. Um, there's a lot to do. So I've got eight steps for us today, everyone, the eight essential steps for successful paraphrasing. Let's look at what they are. So number one, use synonyms. Is there a way to express the conditional symptoms medically, for example? There might be a, you might be a doctor writing to another doctor or nurse to another nurse or whatever your profession. And there might be a way, you know, the patient may have a fever, but you may choose to write um, febrile, you know, so you've got that opportunity. The patient mightn't have any symptoms. You might write uh, uh, asymptomatic. So uh, it is, OET is a language test in your professional area. You can use professional um, terms when writing to another health professional, but always be aware of your audience. The reverse might be true. If you're writing to a member of the public, for example, as pharmacists often have to do, then you might have to simplify technical language and put it in lay terms. But synonyms are a big part of your study. Having said that, sometimes you won't even use synonyms. Sometimes the best word is the word that is simply in the case notes, and you can borrow that word. All right. Next, modify. When you're looking at the case notes, you do you are going to have to make sure that <clears throat> you create a grammatically accurate sentence. So there are words that you're going to have to change. You might have to change verbs from active to passive. Uh, in the OET case notes, you'll rarely see a be verb there, like is or was, <clears throat> are or were, uh, because it's note form. So you're going to have to expand on that so you really got to have that eye for detail you might have to turn adjectives into nouns or adjectives into adverbs and vice versa back the other way nouns into adjectives so modifying words so they fit grammatically um, is essential um omit some some of the words in the case notes aren't going to be relevant to the person that you're writing to. So careful selection is important. And you will need to omit and ask yourselves which details are relevant to the reader and which are not. Then there's a bunch of keeper words. Um, which words are essential and should not be changed? Names of procedures, medical conditions, symptoms. Quite often, we don't need to change those words. We're going to borrow them, we're going to keep them and use them. And it may, and it's also uh, crucial information that needs to be transferred from the case notes into the letter, so that the next person taking over the care of the patient knows exactly what's going on. So we've got our keepers, and a bit of poetic license here: K for combined, normally a C, but phonetically it'll be a K. K for combined. Which facts can be combined to create compound? and complex sentences with the use of various conjunctions, subordinating and coordinating conjunctions. That's our sentence structure. Remember, you're going to be looking at a set of case notes and you don't want to write in simple sentences. They're, they're two pieces of information that are connected. So you're going to have to combine them into one sentence. And I also consider this to be cherry picking. You're going to look at the page. Imagine you're picking cherries. You're looking for the ripe cherries, that the, the most important facts in the case notes. So you may be selecting one piece of information from the social history and another uh, piece of information from the plan, and you combine it together to create an original sentence. So don't just follow the order of the case notes. 
you can cherry pick important details that are connected on the same topic and join them together. That's a very effective um, summarizing technique. Uh, then we got E, E for expand. Which words do you need to make a complete sentence? So as I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about synonyms and that uh, and modifying words, the case notes really are note form, but the task question says expand on the case note. So you must expand. This is a challenge because definitely articles removed. Prepositions, not there. Auxiliary verbs and general verbs also may be replaced by a dash or some sort of symbol. So a lot of these things are removed um, when we write in notes. That helps us to be more concise. So you're looking at a set of notes. When we write a letter, it's a different convention. So we need to really be careful about um, expanding the case notes fully. That's a vital skill for you. Um, lastly, on my list here, I've got rearrange and recheck. So can you move some words around to help focus on the key points and create better flow? So you might have to rearrange. Again, we're not following the order of the case notes. We're providing an overview of the case. So we're going to have to move things around um, and write in different word orders to achieve a natural flow of information with certain time references and signal words where appropriate, creating that flow of information so the reader gets the information that they need when they need it. They don't have to dig deep to find it. It's there um, quite explicitly when they need it. Um, lastly, and um, remember this for exam day, um, when you're writing, just recheck your sentences because um, meaning is a very important part. If you read the case notes a bit too quickly, perhaps you won't capture um, that meaning accurately or if there's potential to miss a detail. So do recheck the case notes and your sentence and make sure you've captured the meaning accurately. If you make a mistake with meaning, um, you could lose marks not only for grammar or sentence structure, but also for content. So um, meaning, um, that's a important aspect. Obviously, you want to reflect accurately what's in the case notes. Again, it's a skill. All right, so look, that's a bit of a background. Now, does anyone know what all these letters mean? Let's put them together. What do these all mean, everyone? S, M. Tell me what word what word do you get? This is our mnemonic. What word have you got here? Yes, Louise's first off there, SMOKA. All right. So that's our acronym, everyone. In your OET preparation, I want you all to be smokers. All right. Synonyms, modify, omit, keep, expand, rearrange. That is your acronym for paraphrasing, everyone. Be a smoker. All right. Be a smoker. Inhale deeply while you are studying for OET. All right. Um, this won't cause you any cancer or, or any lung disease or any ill health. This will actually improve your health, your OET health. Smoking is good for OET health. All right. That's what you need to do. Okay, let's, let's get into it, everyone. So we'll start with this one. And we can see on this image, someone's going undergoing root canal therapy. This is root canal therapy. So we're going to do synonyms, everyone. I'm going to try to explain, um, bring in a bit of a, a medical definition here or a medical way of explaining something. 
So let's see who we've got. Your patient, Mrs. Joyce Williams, needs endodontic treatment to complete root canal therapy on one of her teeth. Now we're assuming today's date is April 2022. Patient, Mrs. Williams. So we're going to go back ooh, one year ago. This is in 2021, April 2021. So we're always careful with our dates. And this person, um, they under, for 237, they had a distal occlusal tunnel. Um, and it was very deep. And there's a 60% possibility of root canal therapy. And they used an x-ray to determine that. That's part of the history. It's a dental case, everyone. Um, but I think you'll be able to understand it. In March 2022, again, there was another issue with 237, and there was a temporary filling put in, but will need RCT, needs that therapy. But the patient says, concerned about the cost, which is to delay the treatment. Ooh, this could be a problem. Can, then they look at this timeline. 4th of April, about two weeks later, there's pain in 37 um, since that insertion of that temporary filling. So an RCT is scheduled for the 10th one week later. Okay, we're going to do this. But then on the 10th, the appointment was cancelled. The patient said pain's gone away. Oh, my God, it's a lot of things happening here. Let's look at how we would capture that, everyone. And I'm going to ask for your help to do this. So um, Mrs. Williams was, all right, now what's a word? Look at the gray here. This is where you get on your keyboard. I need a word to fill this gap. And we're referring back to the initial treatment way back in April 2021. Mrs. Williams was something advised that she, and we need another word for here as well, 60% possibility. What word could we use that reflected 60% possibility? All right. So when you think you know the answer to these gaps, let me know. Answers coming in. Excellent. Ikra and Tarek are first off there. Mrs. Smith was first advised. So we're going back to the, the first date of the when the symptoms first appeared. So this helps us. We could also use initially, as Fayaz wrote. Mrs. Williams was first advised she. Okay, what's a synonym for 60% possibility? It's going to be a modal verb because you've got require, the main verb. So we need a modal verb here. Was first advised that she, yes, a few people are getting it now, that she might, yes, that she might require RCD. So see how we're using synonyms here, everyone? It says 60% possibility, but we put might. Yep. Um, you could also use may in this sense as well. Uh, probably is a little bit strong. All right, so let's keep going. Whoops. Mrs. Williams was first advised that she might require RCT on 237, and I'm going to bring this one up 12 months ago. So that's 12 months ago. Can everyone see that connection very clearly? This is what OET is all about. You've just got to make those links 12 months ago, all right? And then it flows beautifully. So she was advised she might require RCT of 237 12 months ago after a DO tunnel restoration. restoration. She was initially, now we've used initially, something. She was initially. Now we're going back, this was um, in 2022 at this time. She was initially, what's the word that summarizes wishes to delay? She was initially something. 
wishes to delay. Oh, Niza, very quickly onto it, Niza. Yes, she was initially reluctant to undergo RCT. She didn't want to do it. She was reluctant. Due to, she's concerned about the cost. All right, but uh, I can't write concerned about the cost. Due to is a really good thing to write here. Due to, when you use due to everyone, it's a great word, but when we use due to, it's due to plus noun, right? You can't do this due to plus clause. That's wrong, okay? So you've just got to make sure you know this. You might go, due to she was concerned about the cost, but that would be wrong. That's a clause, subject, verb, object. That's incorrect grammatically. But due to is a great sentence because it's followed by a noun phrase, and that helps us write concisely. All right, so that's a winner. Yep, financial issues I can see is good. Yep, her financial situation, good. Due to the expense, Zatash, correctly. Um, fears, probably not quite capturing the meaning there. And, yep, due to the expense. Um, just use singular, due to the expense. Some people are putting in financial constraints. Yes, that's a great word. Tarak, uh, financial crisis, a bit strong. Nimbus trying non-affording. Ooh, due to affordability difficulties, you could use it. Due to the cost, nice and simple, Inner. Yes, you can do that. We're going to use financial constraints here, but there's more than one option. But you can see what you, how you got to write here, how you got to summarize and capture that meaning there. But she agreed to proceed once the tooth became. Patient complains of pain. So what happened to the tooth? The tooth became. Now, pain is a noun. But we're going to need to put an adjective here. So what's the adjective of pain, everyone? What's the adjective of pain? But she agreed to proceed once the tooth became painless. No, the opposite. Yes, Ruth had got it. Painful. That's it. Once the tooth became painful. And that was on the fourth. But then the appointment was. Now, this is a timeline adjective, everyone. The appointment was, and I'll give you a clue for this one. It ends in L-Y. The appointment was, and it begins with S, because she cancelled it. It means after that. The appointment was beep, cancelled when the tooth became, pain's gone away, and that'll be the next one, when the tooth became what? So this is a time marker, everyone. Oh, people are getting it. Yes, good on you, Ojiaj. When the tooth became, when the tooth was, not secondly, no, but good try. Yeah, people are getting it. Suddenly, a bit too strong. Yeah, the word we're looking for is subsequently. The appointment was subsequently cancelled. So that's a really good time marker to put the order of events. When the tooth became, what? What happened to the tooth? The tooth became, pain's gone away. That means it was, use a, a medical term here, everyone. Pain's gone away. It's all good. Don't have a problem. The appointment was subsequently canceled. When the tooth became, yep, I can see some answers. Pain-free, yes, but we can do better. People are putting painless, but a bit simple. Yeah, I'm going to go with Nizza's 
asymptomatic. Tarek as well, asymptomatic. All right. So there it is, everyone. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. That is OET 101 basic skill. It's challenging, isn't it? There's a, a bit of work to do, but you're not writing a whole essay from scratch. You're extracting information from the case notes, putting it into your own words. All right, that's your skill. Synonyms, everyone. Just practice that skill, that pattern. Um, the more you do it, the more confident you will become. And those words will be stored up there in the gray matter, and you'll be able to extract them when you need to. All right, let's try another one. Um, now, is there a way to express, again, we're doing synonyms, but technical terms in patient-friendly language. So in other words, this is a letter to a patient. So this person, they've got um, a bunch of medications here, Panadine, Fort, um, Maxilon, or Metoclopramide, and then we've got adverse drug reactions. There's constipation, abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, dependence, tolerance, impaired alertness, a lot of adverse reactions, um, impaired alertness again, dyskinesia, tardive dyskinesia. All right, we can't, if we wrote all of that information to a patient, we might scare that patient off. They may not take the medication for fear of side effects. So, in this one, you've got to write in a way that reassures the patient, but also warns them of the relevant things to be aware of. So let's do that again, everyone. Panadine Fort has been prescribed for pain relief and should be taken. Okay, what are we going to do here? Max for hourly PRN. All right, you only need to do one of those things should be taken, can't really write max, max is short form, should be taken. And we're writing to a patient, we don't have to write the dosage. So should be taken every four hours, but as needed, beautiful. When necessary, yep, as required, yep. Regularly is a little bit general, um, but you can put as required as because that matches PRN or as needed. You know, you can put, I wouldn't say four times a day because every four hours wouldn't, would that be six? So every four hours would be good, but, but not more than every four hours. So we've written it that way, but not more than every four hours because that's maximum, not more than. This medication can cause constipation, abdominal cramps. What synonym would you give me for abdominal cramps? This medication can cause, okay, synonym, everyone. Abdominal cramps, a little bit. Um, you could use this with patients, but we could soften this a little bit. What does it mean? This medication can cause constipation. Um, abdominal cramps, abdominal discomfort, but give me a synonym for abdominal. Not something that a patient would say, oh, I've got pain in my abdomen, doctor. <laughs> nurse, nurse, this abdominal pain is driving me crazy. Patients won't use that language. Stomach upset sounds good. Yep. Stomach pain, also very good. Yes. And stomach aches. Yep. I've used stomach aches, but could be stomach ache. All right. And nausea. Nausea is okay. Colic, Nimra, not really good. Maybe for the, I wouldn't say colic when writing to a patient. All right. I'd, I'd use... You know, as to written tummy pain, someone's written belly pain. Look, tummy pain is good, but that's more if you're talking to a child. You know, I would use tummy pain, um, possibly in your speaking role play, but not in your formal writing. So tummy's a bit too informal. Okay, now 
I've brought the next one up. Look at this word. To counteract these, there's a great word. To counteract these symptoms. And it says here. Now, counteract comes from here, everyone. Maxillon for side effects of codeine. All right. So we're going to say to counteract these symptoms, Maxillon can be taken because the panadine fort's got the codeine. To counteract these symptoms, Maxillon can be taken up to, all right, TDS, everyone. The patient, your patient will not understand TDS. So we need to use our, our TDS is technical, right? So you can't use TDS. TDS is technical. Three times, yep. Three times. Three times. Three times what? Three times a day. That's it. Three times a day. You can use numerals in your writing in, a, in an OET, in a, in a medical referral letter, because it's a bit like a report. Three times a day. Every eight hours. Very good, Reham. Uh, Zell writes thrice a day, as does Nazarene. Res, Nazrin, uh, don't use the word thrice, everyone. Uh, I'll give you a simple mnemonic. Look, once you can use twice, no problem, thrice. Just memorize this. Don't use thrice. Use once, use twice. Never use the word thrice in your writing. It's a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit non-standard. Um, you can use it if you're writing lyrics to a song or a bit of poetry, you know, a bit of creative writing there, but not in your medical referral letter. So avoid that one, everyone. If that's your habit, if, you're, if that's your version of English, and I know for many people it is, change it. Don't use that word. Add that to your notebook. Lesson learned. All right. Please note, although rare, both medications can cause. Can anyone give me a synonym for impaired alertness? The eyes are starting to droop. You're getting tired. You can't concentrate. Maybe you're driving your car and you're struggling. Um, so these both medications can cause. Mm, impaired alertness, impaired alertness. Confusion, no, I wouldn't say that was a synonym for that. Um, Tarek's onto it. Cognitive symptoms, a bit general. And remember, you're writing to a patient here, Faiza. So dizziness, no, doesn't really match impaired alertness yet. People are getting altered concentration. Nice try, Ife. But altered doesn't really capture it yet. Um, I suppose fatigue's possible, but what we're looking at here, Julie got it, um, as did precious drowsiness. Please note, although both, please note, although rare, both medications can cause drowsiness. All right, so we've captured the meaning everyone um and we've used in this one we've used patient friendly language all right let's continue now we're going to use three in the row here o k and m again another modify um but we're going to you got to ask yourself which information can be safely omitted which details which facts we're going to combine to create some compound and complex sentences and which words are going to be modified? So we're doing a bunch of things at once here. Um, a bunch of things at once. So you are a health professional in a community health clinic. Uh, a patient has been, you've been monitoring, is moving to another city to live with his daughter. So it's Mr. Edmonds, got diabetes, GP prescribed metformin, patient non-compliant, resents having to take medication, says, Always been healthy. He appears unmotivated, takes medication intermittently, double doses sometimes. Now, this is the long version. Let's read it. 
Mrs. Edmonds, oh, that's an error. Someone's used an apostrophe when there shouldn't be one. Mr. That's wrong. Mr. Edmonds was prescribed metformin by his GP for type 2 diabetes. He said he does not need to take the medication because he's healthy. That's a long sentence. He seems to be unmotivated and takes his medication intermittently and sometimes takes double the dose. Now, that's got all the information, but it's so long. So we've got to shorten it, everyone. 28 words in the short version. So that's not a professional way of writing. Mr. Edmonds takes metformin for type 2 diabetes. However, here's our contrast word. However, he has not been compliant. So we're going to use non-compliant. However, he has not been compliant with his medication. We don't need to say all this detail about um, that he resents it and all these reasons. So, however, he has not been compliant with his medication and has a history of intermittent use. So it says takes medication intermittently. So we can formalize that and say has a history of intermittent use and let you do the last one, everyone. Double doses sometimes. Give me, I don't want to write, I want to send them for sometimes. I don't want to really write sometimes double doses. Sometimes a little bit informal and sometimes double doses. What's a synonym for sometimes? Wow, Nazilla, very fast onto it. Excellent, yes. Often, often's probably too strong, Al, I would say. Dre's got it, yep. Someone wrote occasional, not occasional, Nazrin, occasionally. Oh, oh, ah, sorry, it was occasional. Yes, my bad there. Look at this one. Because of the, he has a history of intermittent use and occasion. So a history of disuse and occasional double doses. But if you turn double dose as a noun, we're going to use, if, I'm, if double dose is a noun, dose is a noun, oops, we can use occasional. If I say dose as a verb, then I could put the L-Y. So actually, in this case, you could use both. Occasionally double doses and occasional double doses means he took double the dose. So we've got a, um, different ways to paraphrase that. But what you can gather from this one, let's go back one. So this is your job, 42 words and 28 words, very different. Now you've saved 70% there. And that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do all these cross outs. We don't need to say that the GP prescribed metformin. That's not really relevant. He just takes metformin. We don't need to put all the details about his resentment in this particular case, right? We're just going to summarize the case. He's not been compliant. That says it all. Uh, we do need to mention the history of intermittent use and occasional double doses because that's quite factual. So that's how we do it, everyone. All right. Omit, combine, and modify. Let's do a bit more on omit and a few more synonyms, everyone. So this one, um, if you include too much extra information, it's going to slow the reader down and make it harder to find the key point. So if you look at OET Centre writing cr criteria, one of the things, um, particularly in purpose, they, they say, you know, the purpose of writing is immediately apparent, right? Um, and that, that goes to many areas of the writing. The facts, the relevant facts need to be there and clearly put. Um, if you put non-relevant, unnecessary detail, you're wasting the time of your reader. Your reader is most likely a busy health professional like you. So you don't want to waste their time. You just want to give them the relevant facts. All right. So we that's uh, why we omit information. And we're still going to use some synonyms here to describe the children and the drinking habit. 
So we got Mary Roden. Imagine we're in August 2022. She was born in 1972. She's a teacher. She's got children. Um, she's divorced. Um, she's a non-smoker since first pregnancy. And she drinks occasionally with friends. All right, here's a long one. Mrs. Roden is a divorced English and history teacher at a secondary school who has two children aged 15 and 13, respectively. She stopped smoking when her children were born and enjoys drinking wine with her friends. That's not OET, is it, everyone? Can you see any problems with that? Can you see any problems? Tell me some of the things that are there that what shouldn't be there? What should you omit? In this one, what should you omit? There's a little bit of um, uh, subjective um, language in here, which is not good. There's a little bit of judgment going on, uh, which is not good. Yes, far got it. Yes. Um, divorced, you can't really put divorced, can you, All right? Um, that's not a good idea. We don't need to talk. That's not relevant to her medical case unless you're writing to a psychiatrist or psychologist. It's too long, exactly. Details about kids' ages. Subjects, we don't need to know. She's just a teacher. doesn't matter what she teaches. So lots of issues there, all right? So if you're new to OET and you're only just starting to write, then these are the things you need to consider. So we're going to say, we'll shorten it, Ms. Roden. Now, we can't, we shouldn't really say Mrs., should we? She wasn't given a title here, but if she's divorced, she better to use Ms., Ms. Roden is, we should put her age, a 48-year-old teacher. There it is. That's relevant. With, with what? I'll help you here, everyone. School-aged children, yes, and with two teenage children or two school-aged children, both good, with two teenage children. That's a much nicer way to summarize that. She stopped smoking after her first pregnancy. There you go. After her first pregnancy and is a, what type of drinker, everyone? Drinks occasionally with friends, mainly wine. How would you describe her drinking habits? Ah, uh, yeah, should be 50. Yes, I might have got that. 72. Oops. There's a little typo there. Let's make her older. I think I updated the date on this one. Yes, yeah, she's a social drinker. Because now we need, can't you socially hear? Occasional is good. But because this is a noun, we're going to put an adjective before the noun. And is a social drinker. There it is. Now, look. This is the way you got to write. Just practice this. This is 21 words. This is 37 words. This has a lot of non-relevant information. You're definitely going to be penalized um, if this occurs in your writing. All right. Learn to write in a professional manner. That is what you want. And the good thing is when you learn this now, you'll be able to apply it in the real world after you pass OET. It's a great exam, OET, writing a referral letter. What a great skill. You guys don't need to know how to write a, an, an essay um, like many other language tests. You don't need that. You need to know how to write a referral letter. You can take that into your workplace and be writing referral letters with great skill and expertise, earning respect from your colleagues. It's a good thing. All right, um, expand. So remember we said before the verbs and the uh, some verbs, prepositions, articles have been removed. 
look at this one. Mrs. Cope, nil allergies. So we have to decide what words we would add to make a complete sentence. And you can't do this. Mrs. Cope has nil allergies. There's a problem. Nil is not really English. Nil is Latin. So we need to write, Mrs. Cope has no known allergies. That's the one, everyone. Or no allergies, but a little bit better. Mrs. Cope has no known allergies. All right, so just remember those patterns. Um, and this one, now she does have, Mr. Z has allergies. Codeine, dust mites, sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide. Now, which, I'll ask you, which one of these is non-relevant? If you were writing to, uh, if the patient was about to undergo surgery, right, maybe they needed to have an anesthetic, which of these would you omit if you were writing to a health professional? Would it be codeine? Would it be dust mites? Would it be sulfur dioxide? Which one is not relevant if you're about to undergo surgery? Mm, Anne's has got it, a few people. Dust mites, isn't it? Dust mites. So if you put dust mites, that tells, you know, Mr. Z is allergic to coating dust mites and sulfur dioxide. You're telling the examiner that you're not considering the reader, right? You're putting in something that's completely not relevant for this case. So you have to be very selective when you write. Mr. Z is allergic to codeine and sulfur dioxide. And remember, it's not just a, a blanket yes, no, right, wrong situation here. You know, you've got to use your judgment. There might, you know, different people might have, you know, might include different things or omit different things. Not everybody writes the same. So there's, there's room for a little bit of leeway there. Um, there is a little bit of leeway. Um, However, as long as you can justify yourself why you're writing something professionally, always thinking about the reader, then you'll be able to stay on track. So just use your knowledge as a health professional. All right. Last one, everyone, and this is R for rearrange. R for rearrange. Now, this one, we, we're going back to 2020 for this one. You are a health professional in a clinic and a new patient, Mrs. Melanie Wright, consults you about pain in her left knee. So imagine we're in 2020 in September. So she, she's got a presenting problem, and this is on today's date. Intermittent medial left knee pain, score 3 out of 10. Some swelling, there's intermittent tightness, and in the left posterior thigh, occasional lower back pain, but it's not related. Background, two weeks ago, patient turned suddenly while walking and felt something pop. And it was associated with pain. It was an increase of gym exercises for three weeks prior. Got a similar, okay, now we've got to work out how to put that in order. So the first thing you have to do when you face something like this is just think about the start point. When was the onset of pain? So, and it all started with the gym exercises. And that's a long time ago because this says three weeks prior. So we've got to go, even though today's date is the 23rd of September, it was actually the 19th of August five weeks ago, almost, when the gym exercises increased, right? So that was the trigger factor. Then three weeks later, patient turned suddenly while walking. That's when the pop occurred. And then visited you today with that history, all right? So timelines with OET are crucial, right? Crucial. All right, now let's let's summarize this. Mrs. Wright presented 
Right, what's the word for this? Quite an easy one. Presented something complaining of. So 23rd of September, 23rd of September, she presented when? While I'm waiting for that word, Cherise says she passed OET. Excellent, Cherise, and good luck to you. Glad the videos helped. All right. Mrs. Wright presented something when initially, yes, but we could say initially, but we could also use, yeah, Kelly got it today. Don't write on 23rd of nine. That's not good. She presented today complaining of. Now, how are we going to use two weeks ago? We've got of here. Complaining of. Two weeks ago. So we've got to describe it. Three words here. Complaining of. It's a duration. We can't write two weeks. So you need three words here, everyone. Oh, Reham's onto it. Two-week history. A two, oh, careful, Pfizer, with the plural. Look at this. A two-week history. Not two weeks history. A lot of people are writing two weeks history. No, don't pluralize weeks because it's functioning as an adjective. All right, it's describing a two-week history, not a two weeks a two-week history of intermittent medial left knee pain, three out of 10, with concomitant swelling, associated swelling, and intermittent tightness of the posterior thigh. All right, so we've used that intermittent tightness. The symptoms. Now we've got to go back to the initial start. The symptoms. Not comma, but a dash there. Verl. All right. Uh, the symptoms. So again, what can we do here? Appeared. Yes, the symptoms appeared. But I want two words, everyone. The symptoms and I'm going to bring this began. Yes, began is a good one. But I want another time marker. Started, yes. Had started possible, but now what we want here is first appeared or first occurred. Because that was the pop. That's when it happened when she turns suddenly while walking. There it is, turns suddenly while walking. We can borrow that. Then for three weeks prior to, for three weeks prior to the onset, that's a bit of a hard one, for three weeks prior to that you could put, but for three weeks prior to the onset, she got an arrow what word do we put for an arrow flare up would be good for three weeks prior to the flare up um very nice someone wrote that that was good for three weeks prior to the onset what what grammar do we use for this section Mm. Increase, no. We've got to use past perfect here because it's a time period. Oh, Nazilla's onto it. Some people are saying has no, not has no. Because um, if you want to use has, you're going to use present perfect is here. 
she has recently increased, all right? Um, but we're not using present perfect because we're talking about this time period before a past date. All right. Yes, Mosab. Uh, and we don't want to use had been increased, just had increased. Had increased to exercise at a gym. Verb use can be tricky. I can see lots of variation coming in your responses. Um, so do study your grammar. Verb, if correct, verb use is essential for success, a successful OET attempt. And it's something that we cover all the time in our classes, everyone. So if you are interested in that, come and check out what we do. We're done, everyone. We've done the smoker. We've done the smoker. So my question is, um, are you a smoker? Are you going to smoke when you're preparing for OET? All right. I encourage you to start smoking, not literally, figuratively. Get your paraphrasing skills up to speed. Practice these sorts of activities. Um, do what you need to do. If you like this sort of activity, we do this on a daily basis in our live classes. So do visit us at OET online um, because that can be it's that repetition um, that's going to get you there. All right. Some people are trying to be a smoker. Good. Fires very heavily. Good on you, Fires. <laughs> yeah. All right. A, a few side questions. Nazarene says, does remarking help if reading scores 340? Anything is possible, I would say to you, Nazarene, if you feel confident, no guarantees. It's a 50-50 call. Um, okay, you just never know. Um, you're going to say, do we teach face-to-face -face reading course? Yes, we offer private tutorials, but face-to-face, -face, but online there, Yagane, on Zoom. Absolutely private tutorials as well. Um, Ina says, only during your lessons. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Look, a few things, everyone. If you're wondering about studying, if you are interested, you've got an exam coming up, going to cost you $587, and you want to make sure you're well prepared. Um, one thing we do at OET Online, we've got two types of test preparation. Like for some of you, and everyone, just type in, when's your exam? Is your exam in one month? Is your exam in six months? Just type in when you plan to take the exam. How much duration do you have? I'll explain that later in a moment. Is it one month or, is it, or do you have a long-term plan? If it's one month, We've got a course, our courses are designed for you because you're going to get, if you want to study intensely, you might want to study 40 hours a week, right? So if you can do it intense, because there's 60 hours of past recordings, recent recordings immediately available on demand. So if you've got one month, you study intensely. You've got all your skill building worksheets and quizzes to study, over 150 twice daily live lectures, three hours a day. That's intense. We've got exam quality mock tests to um, check your level and make sure you're progressing. Whoops. And we've got private teacher support as well um, to give you that one-to-one -one tutorials and classes. So if you're in a hurry and you need intense study, you can go for our economy, our turbo or our standard. They're great course options. All right. Even next week, Jay, um, or even in a week, you can do our mock. If you've got a test in a week, you can even do our mock tests this week. Very possible. Um, if you've got, so I can see a lot of people are doing an exam soon, right? But say you're a long term, maybe say December, December is relatively long term. You've got three to four months. So if you're going to do three to four months, perhaps our platinum or ultimate course would be better for you because that's self-paced. I think if you've got the exam coming soon, 
depending on your situation, you might be doing, sorry, you might be doing 40 hours a week study. Might be intense. Maybe you've taken leave so you can do this, right? But if you're doing long term, you might only be able to commit to 10 hours a week. Or it could be 15, depends, right? So the good thing about online study, it doesn't matter. Um, it's very flexible. So if you're the person that's working full time, but you can only do 10 to 12 hours a week, then you can do some of our long term options. It's self paced, everyone, um, to match your schedule. We're all busy, right? You've got all the benefits of the intensive courses. You're just spreading it out. You're going to get over 240 hours of unique live lectures. That means there's no repeats there. It's all original because we believe in um, content. The more content, the more practice you get, the better you get. Uh, we'll give you progress tracking and personalized study plans if you're facing any challenges there. Of course, you still get your private teacher support. Um, and there's also the function, if you need to pause, life gets in the way, change your date, all you have to do is send us an email and we can pause that course for you for a period of time and then restart it. All right, so all of that is possible, everyone. All right, Mohammed says, I have an exam on the 8th and I'm... You're supposed to tell you the topic. Well, I don't have that information, Mohammed. <laughs> I don't have it. And if I did have it, I wouldn't be disclosing it either. But what I can say is, as long as you've done your right preparation, your goal is you shouldn't be scared of this exam. Whatever you face, you've done the prep, you've built the skill. It's an English test. So you've just got to back yourself that you've done all the work. All right. Um, how do we join the course? Um, well, let's go there, everyone. But very briefly, I won't spend long on this, but look, we have a live lecture timetable. So if you're in the Middle East, lots of class times there. Have a look at that. Lots of middle of the day, morning classes for Middle East students. It's Monday to Friday. Grammar, reading, speaking, listening, everything's covered. Writing for medicine, writing for nurses only. Writing for allied professions only. That's two writing classes per week. It's actually six writing classes per week, everyone. Two for medicine, two for nurses, two for the allied health. Who's allied health? Pharmacists, physios, and so on. The other 10 professions um, that aren't um, nurses or nursing or medicine. I don't think anyone else does that. And if you're in North America, West Coast, again, hours are suitable. If you're in Europe or Africa, again, lots of classes in the middle of the day and in the evening. So you will always find class time suitable. And if you miss it, recorded videos are available. So a few people asked, what can I do to sign up? Well, if you want more information in email us here, info at oetonline.net.au, or visit our website. Here's our website, everyone. And I'll give you this link. This is the link to our free taster course. I'll drop it in the chat. Just come to the website. Create an account. Check out the free taster course. Have a look around. Make sure you're happy with it. Um, then select your course, everyone. Um, that's all you have to do. And as I said earlier, look, we have courses for all professions. So all you need to do is click on your profession, whatever it may be, and then you can see all the study options there. All right. And the last thing I'll show you, I'll give you one more link. When you do come here, or to, to join the free taster course, just create an account, everyone, and then confirm that. So here's another link. 
and that will get you into the course and then deciding what it is that you want to do. Okay. And expect to pass OET, everyone, so you can move forward with your career. Join the thousands of people who've studied with OET online and done that. We'll be happy to help you too. All right, well, that's another prep hour. Great to see lots of people here. I hope you got some good use out of this, and I hope a successful um, exam is coming your way soon. Um, thanks for your excellent participation, and um, good luck, everyone, in this exam. See you in a month's time. Bye for now.